today as part of Fermilab's open house, I want to talk to you about machines. Machines are everywhere. We see them and we use them all the time to accomplish tasks that we wouldn't be able to accomplish otherwise. Some machines are quite huge and complicated and difficult to understand. Things like an airplane or a car or even like Fermilab's accelerator complex, which is considered to be one of the largest machines in the world. So what I want to do today is take these complicated machines and break them down into their most basic components, something that we can understand, something called a simple machine. Now, the definition of a simple machine is a tool that uses one movement to complete work. And these simple machines allow us to complete that work by giving us what we call a mechanical advantage. Or in other words, they help us overcome the things that want to stop us from completing the work that we want to do. Things like gravity. Things like friction. Now there are six types of simple machines. There is a lever. There's an inclined plane. There's a wheel and axle. There's a screw. There's a wedge. And there's a pulley. And what I'm going to do today is talk about each one of them, explain what they are and how they work, and give examples of where we use them in our everyday life, even if we don't realize we're using them. And then I want to talk about how we can combine those simple machines so that they work in concert with each other to create more complicated machines. So the first simple machine that I want to talk about is the lever. The lever is defined as a bar which rests on a support to lift or move something. And I'm going to use a lever right now to lift a load. I've got this load right here. It weighs about 40 pounds, so it's kind of heavy. And I'm going to lift it using a lever. Now a lever consists of four main components. You have a bar, you have a support or a fulcrum, you have your load, and then the fourth component would be the force that I'm going to apply to lift that load. So I'm going to rest my bar on the fulcrum, and then if I apply a load here at the end of the bar, you can see I can lift that load. Now, interesting thing about the lever, right now I've got the support or the fulcrum right about midpoint between the load I'm lifting and where I'm applying the force. And without measuring, it feels like the force that I have to apply there is about the same as it took to lift that load in the first place. But if I move the support in so that now I've got more bar on my end, it gets a lot easier to lift that load. And in fact, if I move it all the way in, watch this, I can lift that load with one finger. I could never lift a 40 pound load with one finger without the help of a lever. Another example of a lever is the wrench. You probably have wrenches around your house. Here I've got this screw in a piece of wood and there's no way that I can turn this with my fingers to loosen that screw. And even if I could, it would hurt my fingers. But if I take this wrench, use it maybe, using it as a lever, I can very easily turn that screw and get it to the point where it's loose and I can get it out. And speaking of levers, I'm lifting this piece of wood up and down. What's acting as a lever? My arm is acting as a lever. In fact, my body is full of levers. Everything I do getting around, every action I take pretty much is using one part of my body or another as a lever. A teeter-totter is a lever, even if it's a bee. Come to think of it, a bee's wing is a lever, too. Interesting fact about levers, they were first described and studied by an ancient Greek scientist named Archimedes. And Archimedes was quoted as saying, give me a lever long enough and I can move the earth. Now, he also thought the earth was flat, but you can still understand the point that he was trying to make. The next simple machine that I want to talk about is the inclined plane. 
The definition of an inclined plane is a flat surface like this that connects a lower level to a higher level. So I have an inclined plane set up here, and you see I can roll all kinds of stuff down there. Here's a couple of balls. Here's my sleeping bag. Not too exciting, huh? In fact, the inclined plane is probably the least obvious, most boring of all the simple machines. We tend not to even think of it as a machine because it doesn't have any moving parts. It's just kind of there, part of the landscape. But it is a machine, and it is no less important than any of the others. A slide is an inclined plane. Even a stairway or a ladder is an inclined plane. It's not a flat plane, so to speak, but a series of them arranged in an incline to enable us to go up and down. Inclined planes can help cars cross rivers. Hikers and bikers to get up steep hills. And wheelchairs to access buildings that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. Do you like sledding? Try doing it without an inclined plane. So far we've talked about the lever and the inclined plane. Two simple machines that give us our mechanical advantage by allowing us to counteract the effects of gravity or at least control them to our advantage. Now I want to talk about a simple machine which gives us a mechanical advantage by reducing friction, and that would be the wheel and axle. Now, there are several inventions that have revolutionized the course of history, but the wheel and axle is certainly one of the top ones of all time. And the definition of a wheel and axle is really pretty simple. It's two objects, usually round or roundish, which are joined at the center. Now, the way that a wheel and axle works is it takes what would normally be sliding friction and instead gives us rolling friction. And rolling friction is quite a bit less than sliding friction. So you see I have this toy car here and I've taped the wheels so they can't spin. And so you see if I apply a force to it, you know, it's going to take pretty good force to get it to go all the way across the table. But if I take the tape off the wheels, you'll see that it takes very little force to get it to go all the way across the table. So watch this. Eh, we don't have brakes, help! Now I know you're all familiar with wheels. They're on your toys, they're on your bike, you see them on cars, you see them on trains. They're even on airplanes to help them to get out to the runway and back. But wheels help us not only by getting from one point to another, but they also allow us to move heavy loads, loads that are much heavier than we'd be able to move otherwise from one point to another, as you can see here. And wheels are not just for moving things around. There are lots and lots of uses for wheels. Well, I'll show you one. You can see here I've made this delicious pizza, and I am going to use this pizza cutter, which is a wheel, to slice it. Yum! Wheels show up in lots of things that you don't think of as wheels. Even a doorknob is a type of wheel. Hey, get out of here! Oops. Well, maybe when we're done, you can look around your house and see what wheels you can find. So far, we've talked about the three primary types of simple machines. We've talked about the lever, we've talked about the inclined plane, and we've talked about the wheel. The next three types of simple machines in many ways are variations on the first three. In fact, sometimes they're not even included in discussions about simple machines. But because their functions are so unique, and because this is my video, I'm going to talk about it. So the first one I want to talk about is the screw. We're all familiar with screws. There's screws all over your house. What simple machine do you think that the screw is a variation of? I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it. Did you come up with anything? The screw is actually a variation on the inclined plane. Hard to visualize? Well, imagine, if you will, 
a long, skinny, inclined plane that's straight. And then you take that and wind it around and around and around, and you have a screw. And what the screw does then is that when I turn it in a circular motion, and I'm going to do that using a lever, by the way, when I turn it in a circular motion, it gives me movement in the direction along the shaft. So you can see as I'm turning this in a circular motion, the screw is headed that direction. Still having trouble visualizing how a screw is basically a wound up inclined plane, perhaps this slide makes it easier to see. Imagine we start with a long straight slide and then we wind it round and round. Now we have a slide that's a screw. And even though the kids are going round and round, their general direction is down along the shaft of the screw. The first screw begins with our buddy Archimedes in about 250 BCE. But he didn't invent a metal fastener type screw like this. He invented a screw to pump water. Now imagine, if you will, a screw like this and you place it inside a hollow tube where it fits fairly snugly and then the bottom of it is submerged in water. So now when you turn the screw, the water is trapped between the threads and the sides of the tube and it moves up. And so he designed a screw type pump to move water up and move it to fields where he could irrigate the fields. The screw type pump that he designed is still used in many pretty amazing applications, or at least the concept of it is. For example, there's a small screw type pump which is used in open heart surgery to move blood through your body while they're working on your heart. There's large screw type pumps used at SeaWorld to move water around. And we have screw type pumps at Fermilab in our deep underground experimental areas to pump water out and keep them from flooding. Now, if you're like me, <clears throat> you tend to you hear the word screw and you think metal fastener. But there's lots and lots of other places where screws are used. For example, we screw in a light bulb with threads on the bottom of the bulb. We unscrew the lid of a jar and screw it back on to seal it. In fact, if you use the expression, screw something in or unscrew something, you're probably using a screw. Screws are also used for accurate positioning. For example, I have this um, adjustable wrench here, and by turning this screw, I can adjust the size of the wrench to whatever I want. Or I have this C-clamp here, and again, by turning this screw, I can adjust the size of the clamp, and I can even use it, using this lever, by the way, to clamp this piece of wood. Next, I want to talk about the wedge. Now, the definition of a wedge is a machine that has one or two sloping sides ending in a point. It can be used to either lift or split something, and it can be used to either move something or stop it from moving. So the classic wedge is the head of this hatchet here. You can see it has two sloping sides, so we call this a double wedge, that end in a sharp point. And so we can use this hatchet for splitting wood. Now, since I'm not allowed to split wood in the house, watch this guy do it for a second. A knife is also a wedge. It's similar in design to the hatchet in that it has two sloping sides that come to a sharp point. It's just skinnier. So watch me as I use this wedge, this knife, to cut this apple. You see it separated the sides, cut through it, and then separated it. So now watch me as I use my own personal wedges, my teeth, to take a bite of this apple. Hmm. Now wedges come in a lot of different shapes. For example, this chisel is a wedge. This is a machine or a tool which is used to chip away at either wood or metal or stone. Sculpture, sculptures would use a chisel to create interesting shapes. A nail is also a wedge. It's different in that it doesn't have defined sides. It's round, but it still works on the same principle as, that as you hammer it down into the wood. It's pushing the wood aside 
as it passes down through there. Another example of a wedge that you might see, which is much bigger, is a snowplow. A doorstop is an example of a wedge that rather than being used to move something, is used to stop it. This is a one-sided wedge, and the way you use it is you just wedge it in there. And again, if you're using the term just wedge it in there, you're probably using a wedge. Hey, let me out of here! So did you guys figure out which other simple machine the wedge is a variation of? Well, it's a variation of an inclined plane. You see here, we have one inclined plane here. This hatchet has two inclined planes that are on opposite sides to each other. So just like the screw, the wedge is a variation of that inclined plane. So we have one other simple machine that we need to talk about yet. The last simple machine that I want to talk about is the pulley. And the pulley is a variation on the wheel. Now the definition of the pulley is that it's a wheel with grooves and a rope through it. And you can lift and lower loads easily by pulling on the rope. Now the first pulley probably were not wheels. It probably was just a tree branch with a rope tossed over it. And then you could, by pulling on the rope, again, you could lift your load. Now, one thing you can see about this pulley is that, it, and not all pulleys do this, but it changes the direction of the load. So in other words, if I want to lift my load up, I can lift it by pulling down. And pulling down is easier than pulling up because imagine if this tree branch was way up high and I had a load I wanted to lift, I could get down and I could you know, pull down and get my whole body weight into it, making it easier to lift that load. So I have a pulley system here and we're going to take some data. Here's a single pulley fixed to this bar here. I have a four and a half kilogram load down here. I have a scale so I can measure the force that I'm using to lift that load. And I have a bar here which is set 16 centimeters over the ground. That way it's just a set distance to use for comparison to raise that load. So if I put my scale on here and I lift this load, I can see that I'm using four and a half kilograms force to lift that load. Pretty simple and obvious. And um, if I lift the load 16 centimeters, I think you can figure out that I'm moving the rope or using 16 centimeters of rope to lift that load. Again, pretty obvious. Now you might say, well, that didn't make it any easier. But again, if this was up high and I was pulling down, I could get my body weight into it. And it may seem awful obvious that I use 16 centimeters of rope to lift that thing 16 centimeters, but you'll see why I bring that up in a minute. There's variations I can make to my pulley system to make lifting that load even easier. Rather than having a fixed pulley with the pulley up here, I've connected it to my load, and when I pull the rope, it moves along with my load. So I have a movable pulley. So let's see now how much force it takes to lift this four and a half kilogram load. Huh. It takes two and a quarter kilograms to lift that load now, exactly half. So what happened? Was it magic? Did this thing suddenly get lighter? Or is there some kind of a trade-off? Well, let's see how much distance, how much rope I have to pull to lift that 16 centimeters. So I have a, a yardstick here. It's kind of crude, but it'll get us there. So I'm starting at about here. I lift that. About 16 centimeters, and I have to use 32 centimeters of rope to lift my load 16 centimeters. So double the length of rope to lift my load. So in actuality, I've done the same amount of work. It's just that it seems easier to me because I would rather lift a lighter load. The difference between 16 and 32 centimeters of rope I didn't even notice, but the load is lighter. Now we can even take this one step further. 
So now I've created a compound pulley. I've added another pulley to my pulley system. So now the rope is anchored here on the bar. It goes down through one of these pulleys, up around this pulley, down through another one of these pulleys, up to me where I'm gonna apply a force. So let's see how much force it takes now to lift my four and a half kilogram load. It takes one and a half kilograms. So how much length of rope do you think it's gonna, I'm gonna need to lift it 16 centimeters? Well, again, this is gonna be a pretty crude measurement, but let's see, I've got my yardstick on the floor there now. Um, I'm starting with the rope right at the top of this bar. So let's lift my 16 centimeters. So here's how much rope I used. Let's see what length it is. Looks like about 48 centimeters, three times the length of rope. So I, the load that it takes to lift that is one third of what the original load is. And the length of rope that I need to use to lift it a fixed distance is three times. So do you see a pattern here? Again, I'm still doing the same amount of work, but it seems even easier. Now I could keep adding pulleys to that. Eventually, it's gonna take so much rope that that won't be practical to do so. I, I'll wanna find what the optimum number of pulleys is to make that easy to lift. Now there's other applications for pulleys that you probably have seen. Uh, for example, uh, the flagpole at your school probably uses a pulley. You may have seen a pulley on the back of a tow truck. Or you may have seen a pulley on a crane. Pulleys are the simple machine of choice for cartoon villains who want to lift heavy loads like a safe or a piano and drop it on their nemesis. So watch Wile E. Coyote try to do that in this clip. Before we go, I said that we would talk about how simple machines are combined together to work in concert with each other and perform even more complicated tasks. So let me give you a few examples of that. So we already talked about this knife, and we talked about how the knife blade was a wedge. But when I use this knife to cut, I'm also using the handle as a lever. So the knife is actually a wedge-lever combination. Now what do you think I get if I take two of these wedge-lever combinations and connect them together? Well, I get some scissors. Here's another one. <clears throat> so I'm in the middle of making this hamburger, or maybe it's a pancake, it's kind of hard to tell. And I have this spatula. How many simple machines do you think I can squeeze out of the spatula? Well, if I hold it at an angle and push it to lift my burger pancake up, I've used it as a wedge. If I hold it at an angle and let my burger pancake slide back off, it's an inclined plane. And if I flip it, it's a lever. And all the while, the handle of this thing is a lever. So three simple machines squeezed out of this one little plastic thing from the dollar store that doesn't even have any moving parts. Now let's get a little bit more complicated. So here's my bike. What simple machines are there? Well, I just flipped down the kickstand, which is a lever, and actually inside there, there's a wedge holding the kickstand in place. There's the two wheels, which are probably the most obvious simple machines on this thing, but this is also a wheel, the pedal. Uh, what else we got? Well, we got um, the chain and sprocket combo down there is a pulley. The handlebars are levers. The brake levers are levers. The brakes are levers. If you take apart, that if you've ever taken apart the handlebar assembly, you see that inside here, there are two wedges which slide against each other and set the height of the handlebars. 
And I'm sure if we took more time, we could find all kinds more simple machines on my bike. But I want to show you one more. And that's a pretty simple thing, but I think it's kind of cool. It's the can opener. So the can opener has two levers. And if I squeeze these levers, it applies, allows this wedge right here, which is also a wheel, it applies enough force on it to allow it to pierce the can. And then when I turn these levers, it turns that wedge wheel as well as a couple other wheels which rotate the can and cause that wedge to go all the way around and open the can. Here's a fun fact about the can opener. Canned food was introduced in 1809, but the can opener wasn't invented until 1858. So for almost 50 years, how do you think they opened cans? Well, that's something I want you to think about. If you had opened a can and you didn't have can opener, how would you open it? And what simple machine would you be using to do that? Well, I want to say one other thing, and that's that if you find it interesting or kind of cool or kind of fun to dig into all these machines and analyze them and figure out what simple machines are operating there, you may be cut out to be an engineer or a physicist. Now, notice I didn't say if you got it all figured out, you may be cut out to be an engineer or a physicist. Figuring it out is something you can learn. But if you have the interest and you think it's kind of cool, that's something to consider in the future. So I want to thank you all for listening, and I want you to enjoy going out there and using all the simple machines you can. Pay attention to them. Thanks.